to the Erna Ferguson Library feature of the Poets in the Library series. My name is Mary Oishi. I'm the Poet Laureate of Albuquerque, and I'm so pleased to welcome the two featured poets today who live in the vicinity of the Erna Ferguson Library. The first is Liza Wolf Francis. Liza Wolf Francis is a poet and writer with an MFA in creative writing from Goddard College who served two terms as a member of the Albuquerque Poet Laureate Program's Selection Committee and continues on the Organizing Committee. She was on the 2008 Albuquerque Poetry Slam team and she has a chapbook called Language of Crossing, which is on my bookshelf at home. It's a wonderful book. Please welcome Liza Wolf Francis. Hi, I am so pleased to be here today, just so honored. And I am gonna read a few poems about our planet Earth. I've been thinking a lot about the climate and a lot about the, the planet and here in New Mexico. So I'm gonna kinda of keep that theme. The first one is called Earth Stories. Many tales tell how I was not birthed from mother, but I did come from her. Every day I shed the dust that is her desert, her forest loam, her islands, her mountains, and I settle into my own animal self. I almost forgot her caress amid the collective noise we owned, so loud it was hard to hear her speak. Sometimes I moved fast over her, unaware of her and even of my own self. When I slowed down, I was grateful for her silence, for the trees she birthed, scent of water over dry land, chatter of the house finch, cawing of crows, each single spine on a cactus and the point each one comes to against the sky. And grateful also for me in this living shell, this moving home. I too am one of her creations. Poetry gnaws relentlessly at my acorn brain. Her oxygen flows into the caverns of my being and here in the desert, rocks rolled in dust, dirt that I too gave back shapes that at first glance appear to have no meaning. That was when I saw the mountain at sunset, a robin in the forest, a roadrunner at dawn. I heard the river pass me by and I began to relearn to fall in love. There is nothing like the scent of rain on her skin, nothing like the green bodies that reach for her sun, nothing like the creatures that roam the landscapes of her form. I would never want to not call that love. So the next um, few that I'm gonna do um, include the Rio Grande. And I just wanna say I went down to the river yesterday um, as I often do with my son and it's flowing really strongly. And we were getting actually pulled by the current and it was a whole ordeal. Um, but it just feels so good in the heat to be feeling the river water on your feet um, and on your body, skin. Keep breathing. Summer sun turned our home into a heat island, or maybe it was me who did that with language. In June, July, September, when the heat of this city follows me like fire and even the tree canopy of the bosque is hot, I go to the river, wade into its cool spittle and mud, until its waters move around me up to my thighs, its currents try to carry me with it. My love for earth is spread out, even in the dry dirt vein ditch of land that traces paths in old passages of water, the ones that carved mountains, wrestled with ancient tongues in the flow in the crawdads, like the dead one found by my child a week ago. If not the river, I go to the top of the mountain where the thin air is cooler, the trees proud, where the desert heat of a warming earth does not follow me. When the story I want to rewrite from apocalypse to hope takes flight, each of us a story, the ancestors, the forecestors, those to come, my stories, our stories of heat of the sun, of the cold of dead stars at night, bath of moon wrestled with a past as sacred as a song, scent of microorganisms in dirt, a story of tomorrow of today.
So this next poem is again about the river and it is, if you can see it, just the shape of it is like the flow of river. Um, and again, the currents right now in that river, <laughs> they're a little intense, but, but still, you know, beautiful. No one taught me to read river water. I didn't learn the mysteries of its text or how to identify whether trout are male or female but I watched the tan brown currents of the Rio Grande for signs of where it will go next, this water that fish memorize the taste of. My body, almost 70% water, body of earth, almost 70% water. The sandbank at river's edge that I lay on in summer, dangled my cool feet to take away the ferocity of sun, was gone by December. River moved 30 feet east, and I bet that move was foreshadowed months ago in its currents. When the temperature of the day is just warm enough, the city's heat island stifling, I go to river, take its temperature with my toes, my fingers, wipe drops on my forehead so river will remember the taste of me, my sweat, my fever. I try to gauge its pressure, speak to it, offer thanks to it, bribe it with coins, pet it with my hands, spit into it to join my spit with deer and coyotes who drink from it, with snow wash and mountain, to try to go with it as far as it goes through New Mexico into Texas, through hills shaped like the backs of dinosaurs, beside water shacks right up against it. Every so often, the wind will read river aloud, and for a moment or longer, if I can breathe it in, hold it inside of me, I understand the text of river and my body knows it as if it had always understood. Okay, this is the last poem I'm gonna read. I wanna thank Mary Oishi. She is so awesome as our poet laureate right now. Um, and I just, again, feel so honored to be here. Um, last one for our planet and thinking here um, about connectedness and um, our world here in, in New Mexico. I was named Wonder. I recite the same constellations every sky I see. Beside dandelions, under the light of stars long dead, the whir about me of bent mosquitoes. The first man I saw naked was not yet a man and I not yet a woman. My name was a bamboo forest, now of cottonwoods and geese. My organs belong to river, to mountain, this human animal body and world dances in my forest with their branches and their particular bugs. The living always takes over the dead and their stars that come to rest, especially in those places where I have been invited into the burrows of prairie dogs. My fingers scratching, digging my nails like claws stained with dirt, places where I was invited into the colonies of bats, my wings and toes revved like a car club car having difficulty taking off. Poetry is preservation of the natural world and all I have watched myself destroy year after year. How slow destruction can seem until it catches up. I keep trying to save my kinship with wonder, but the demands I make of the earth, of the cosmos, my need for nourishment at the expense of planetary limbs all get in the way of my view of myself from space. Connectedness is a gift. When I am grounded, not lost, it is nature that teaches me attention. I hear, I listen, how alive I can feel, how alive this ecosystem can feel, as if they were breathing with me. This landscape has a belly that expands, shoulders that tighten, a throat that sighs in their frontiers and histories, and the not newness my whole life is connected to, this planet, this cosmos. Thank you. Thank you so much, Liza. Our next featured poet is Rich Boucher. Rich Boucher resides in Albuquerque. He, in the vicinity of the Erna Ferguson Library, Rich's poems have appeared in The Nervous Breakdown, 1870, Menacing Hedge, Drunk Monkeys, and Cultural Weekly, among others. Rich serves as associate editor of the literary magazine, Bombfire. He is the author of All of This Candy Belongs to Me, which is also in my collection, a collection of poems published by Jules Poetry Playhouse Publications. Peep richboucher.bandcamp.com for more. He loves his life with his love, 
Leanne, and their sweet cat, Callie. Please welcome Rich Boucher. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for being with me today. My name is Rich Boucher. I am an Albuquerque poet. I'm here today to bring a poem to you from my book, All of This Candy Belongs to Me. And this poem is a timely choice, I think, a poem based upon the notion and the idea and the debate going on in this country now about living wages. This poem is called McDonald's Hiring Poster. In the first vision, I see the McDonald's hiring poster, the way I first saw it in my life, the way I first lived in 1986 in my life, when I got that first job just after high school and right before forever, back in that manager's office. And there were nine of them, nine free Americans, all smiling at me from just inside of that bright red and yellow poster, standing in tight three by three formation and viewed from an angelic vantage point above them all. They were every race and creed and sexual flavor, all with the same exact, exact white teeth. African Americans, white dudes, and a winking pink dudette, and every shade of the rainbow grinning together in name-tagged, two-dimensional harmony. Gay, straight, elderly, heavyset, nerdy, tough, and milk-fed, these Stepford Paragons gazed upon me lovingly, knowing that I was about to join the greasy slavery. All nine of them looking at me, and I swore I saw them all looking, licking their lips as I waded slowly in, waited until I was up to my chest in a swamp of cooking oil, and everything was America, and I had to smile because I had a Coke, and America coated me in a sheen of submission. I was her boy. In the second vision, inspired by the lifetime experience of serving the public, which has always meant serving the devil, which has always meant minimum wage for maximum abuse. I see it, the McDonald's hiring poster, frighteningly, fearsomely out of the frantic dark, harshly spotlit on a musty cellar wall in the swinging off-kilter glare of my unsteady flashlight. And then I run and then stop, whirl around, Panting and terrified in a most lost and very haunted house, all nine multiracial and multisexual and multi-trans candidates for fast food employment lift their bowed heads, and then their happy faces change, morph into scowls. I see the eyes on all nine hollow out in an instant, their glares floating quickly and irrevocably straight for me from their depths of their empty eye sockets. In the third vision, I see the McDonald's hiring poster tumbling up into the dark of the night air, aloft on a stinking, apocalyptic breeze, half crumpled, one corner ablaze like I just missed whoever lit it with a lighter, and I can see the multi-hued and multi-identity McDonald's employees, the young African-American girl, the older white lady, the middle-aged guy whose ethnicity I can't know, the teen person who I think is trans like it matters what I either think or guess anymore, and they are all together, unlike any hiring poster I have ever seen. They're not not looking at me at all. They don't care if I want the job or not. They don't care if I get hired or not. Instead, they are bickering and fighting with each other, shoving and screaming into each other's faces like as if as though just like they were at an American rally that was held in America to talk about America, just like America has become one big angry rally and melting pot screaming match. I can make out the legend, welcome to the team at the headline at the top of the poster, as the flames burn on, eating up the people who once smiled at me because McDonald's once McDonalded them into whole actualized contributors to the economy. In the fourth vision, I see the McDonald's hiring poster years and years and uncountable years after the presidency of the monster after America switched back to black and white, after decades and decades of nuanced full color, after the end of the era of facts and truth, I see the McDonald's hiring poster faded to a quiet, mere pastel of its former day glow, dilapidated, only three rusted staples fixing it, steady to a billboard outside in the rain, the rain making every face on that hiring poster cry. All nine prospective McDonald's team members weep, wail, and moan from the confines of the poster. Some of them reach to cover their mouths to stop the sobbing at the same time that I do. Why do these visions come to me now? 
Why do these visions come at all? How many more will there be? And what do they mean? Who is the person who can explain? Who can answer? Thank you, Rich. We have such a wealth of poets here in Albuquerque, and I'm so pleased to present them at each of our local public libraries. And now here to talk about the library is librarian Anna Roberts. Hi, I'm Anna Roberts, one of the library staff here at the Erna Ferguson Library. The original library here at 3700 San Mateo opened in 1966 and was named after Erna Ferguson. Erna Ferguson was born in 1888 to a prominent Albuquerque family. She was the granddaughter of New Mexico pioneer, merchant, and developer Franz Huning, and the daughter of Harvey Ferguson, a New Mexico territorial delegate to Congress and later the state's first congressman. Erna Ferguson had an interesting and varied life. She taught in the Albuquerque Public Schools as a young woman and later served as the Red Cross Home Service Secretary and State Supervisor during World War I. She briefly wrote a column called Do You Remember for the Albuquerque Herald newspaper and later started a dude wrangling business in 1921 with another woman that took vacationers on adventures to see the sights in New Mexico and the Southwest, making all the travel arrangements for them. After Erna Ferguson sold her business about five years later, her brother Harvey suggested she draw on her adventures as a tour guide and traveler to write a book. Her first book, Dancing Gods, Indian Ceremonials of New Mexico and Arizona, was published in 1930. She wrote another 13 books between 1930 and 1955. Her books always started with a journey to the area she was writing about, up to 20,000 miles of travel to research her topic, often during times of conflict and enduring many kinds of personal discomforts. Contemporary reviews of her books laud her for her vivid, colorful descriptions, her shrewd observations, and interpretations of her experiences, her warmth and wit, and the conversational style of her writing. Erna Ferguson wrote at a time before travel became widespread and helped make the Southwest and Latin America seem like real and accessible places. For this reason, she is often referred to as the first lady of New Mexico letters. In addition, Erna spent many years as an active participant in the Albuquerque community. She was a popular guest speaker at UNM and for other local organizations. She helped found the Old Town Historical Society now the Albuquerque Historical Society, in 1947. Around the same time, she was on the Ernie Pyle Memorial Committee that created the first neighborhood library from Ernie Pyle's house. Erna Ferguson was also known for creating a kind of salon at her home, welcoming guests from all walks of life, including scientists, writers, and artists. Erna Ferguson died in 1964. The library that bears her name was the sixth library to open in Albuquerque. The original 1966 building was 7,200 square feet. That building was renovated and expanded to 15,200 square feet in 2003. We're fortunate to be next door to the Palo Duro Senior Center and have Montgomery Park and Pool nearby. Erna Ferguson is one of the busier libraries in the system and is open seven days a week. Before the pandemic, we had several children's programs every week a monthly Lego club and craft programs, and an adult book club. We also have ukuleles and cake pans to check out, along with the more usual books, magazines, DVDs, and CDs. The other prominent feature of the Erna Ferguson Library is our very recognizable public art project called Alphabet Soup, which is a sculpture by Pete Beeman that was commissioned in 2005. Metal letters flow down the southeast side of the building and onto the grounds and sidewalks around the library. When customers forget the name of our building, they sometimes say, it's the one with the letters. We do hope you'll come visit us soon at the Erna Ferguson Library. Thank you, Anna. And now we're going indoors to uh, hear from the community poets who also live in the neighborhoods around the Erna Ferguson Library. Well, now we're going indoors for the community poets. These are poets who live in the neighborhoods around the Erna Ferguson Library. We're gonna start with Iris Gersh. 
Iris Gersh has an MFA in creative writing from Florida International University and has lived in Albuquerque since 2005. Her writing has been published in the Packing House Review, Missing Persons, Monsanto Mountain Review, and Fixed and Free Anthologies. She served as vice president for the New Mexico State Poetry Society from 2017 through 2019. In December 2020, her first poetry collection, A Thousand Questions, was published by Finishing Line Press. Please welcome Iris Gersh. Hi, thank you for inviting me, Mary, and to be among all these poets. And uh, I am kind of uh, reading poems that have to do with Mental Health Awareness Month. Uh, I don't necessarily think that I'm writing about mental health or about things that have happened, but I have, so let me share. Uh, the first one is called Same Color Eyes for Linda. When she did not answer repeated knocks, I kicked in the dorm door, found her in a tub of black water, hair dye streaking her serene brown face. She said, except this Irish kabibble, the end is near. What followed in the next week Citywide church visits, a book snatched from a pew, a book left on the way out near the candles, but no church, no person tolerated a young woman in 1970 rushing the apocalypse. And then again, the books, the Bible, Invisible Man, anything by Hess, Kafka, strewn on dormitory floors relevant pages open so that everywhere we looked we read clues to her way of thinking one night she wandered streets nude knocking at any apartment door insisting her father lived there we knew he had committed suicide a cop brought her back to the dorm her broad frame covered by his coat I followed her onto the roof one night, afraid she might kill herself at 19. She asked me to stare at the clock atop the corner pharmacy on Buswell and Beacon until we both saw its hands move hours ahead in one moonlit minute. Then without studying the context or its probability, I believed her discourse about a world reunion in Micronesia, where everyone's eyes are the same color. Days later, with May 4th massacre, Kent State shootings, and colleges closing, she called our dorm mother, Honky Bitch. And then I learned the cost of madness when I saw her hands cuffed behind her back, dressed in a purple robe like a regal woman stepping into a paddy wagon. I have another poem, which is from the book, A Thousand Questions. Um, sorry, okay. Uh, it is called Crazy Women. A friend of mine, more manic than depressive, bought $300 of marine equipment and never owned a boat. Another woman, while in a car with me from California to New Mexico, sucked straight from a can of processed cheese, the empty nozzle sound driving me crazy on the six lane highway. And crazier still when she told me to pull over so she could meditate. In the south end of Boston, pre-gentrified, Drunk women draped over parked cars, figures among shrouded in snow, Victorian lamplights. They talked to themselves or anyone who would listen. Could it take much to go over that edge? Some of their mouths twitched as if they had so much more to say. They contorted their hands as if they might never touch again. 
Some disappeared like Eve's footsteps when she grabbed the half-eaten apple and ran away from the rib giver. Crazy no women no longer seem outsiders, isolated wisps atop mountain peaks. Sometimes now I visit their world, a place without geography, not unknowingly, not unwillingly, just to twitch, contort, and disappear. Thank you. Thank you, Iris. That's a really important topic right now. Uh, in the wake of the pandemic and people getting vaccinated, we're going back to our lives, but it's not that simple. There's still many residuals from uh, having endured a, the past year or so. Our next poet is Jennifer Lynn Crone. Jennifer Lynn Crone writes poems that make her friends and family ask, are you okay? She is okay and has published work in Pleiades, The Pinch, and Storm Cellar, among others. Please welcome Jennifer. Hello, and thank you for having me um, read. I really appreciate this. So the poems I'm going to read are reflecting on childhood and kind of particularly girlhood and how a lot of events and experiences kind of uh, shape uh, our lives later on. So the first poem is called Grandmother Forbids Me From Being a Witch for Halloween the Year, year I Learned to Tell Fortunes. The spring dust devils invade the playground as the girls huddle around a Sybil and her Lisa Frank notebook. She draws purple glitter spirals for us each and pronounces our future. You will live in a shack married to Corey D with 13 kids and drive a Mercedes. Soon we all carefully spell M-A-S-H across the top of wide ruled paper. Years later, the same girl proclaims that she wouldn't dare touch a tarot card or a Ouija board they invite the devil in. She explains that divination is a sin, almost as bad as suicide and premarital sex. I don't point out that she's already a witch, that what she fears is the aesthetic, not the game. If I did, she'd laugh. So many grown women forget the magic they once performed. And my other poem is called, The Scar Will Look Like a Face. You lie on the roof of your best friend's garage, imagining flood. Only you two survive. The clamor of her mother's television won't let you forget the existence of other people. If only I could think hard enough, if only I could concentrate, your friend says. You're not sure what she wants with telekinesis. You've seen Carrie. Firestarter, how her pupils dilate as she pours alcohol on her palm and sets herself ablaze. She claims it doesn't hurt, pain's a lie, used to keep you in line. The sun hurts your head. You close your eyes and still see red. I suspect it's the words you say. The right ones can crack the world open. You envision reality an eggshell. At four, you believe TV a portal. One day, you reached out, glass. Now you believe spells could open that door. But what would you do with a venture? You're overwhelmed by geography homework. You smoke cigarettes with a smoking kill sticker stuck on the pack. I want, I want, you say over and over again, but never finish the sentence. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Jennifer. At four, you believe the TV to be a portal. <laughs> it's nice. Okay, the next poet is Rebecca Aronson. Rebecca Aronson is the author of Anchor, forthcoming from Orison Books in November 2021. Ghost Child of the Atalanta Bloom, winner of the 2016 Orison Books Poetry Prize and winner of the 2019 Margaret Randall Book Award from the Albuquerque Museum Foundation. 
and Creature Creature, winner of the Maine Traveled Roads Poetry Prize in 2007. She has been a recipient of a Prairie Schooner Strauss Award, the Loft Speakeasy Poetry Prize, and a Tennessee Williams Scholarship to Suwannee. Please welcome Rebecca Aronson. Thank you, hi. Um, thank you, Mary, for inviting me, and it's great to, to be with you guys. Um, all right, I'm going to read two poems. Um, the first one is uh, from, it's one I wrote recently. Um, my mother, who recently passed away, um, spent the last couple of years in a assisted living facility um, and had pretty severe dementia. So I've spent a lot of time over the last couple of years thinking about um, this person losing herself and losing language and memory. And so uh, this poem, What Have I Ever Needed to Say, is sort of reflecting on that. What have I ever needed to say? When my mother asks, what do we have to do with the chair? She might mean something about the room she lives in, which will never become familiar. Or maybe she'd like the blinds drawn against the blinding gray white day. It's not any time here, she tells me, and I agree. Not Christmas, not Tuesday, not the liminal hour when everything softens and stripes orange and gold like the colors of the woven silk shawl she used to toss over her bared shoulders on a warm summer night, no. If everything is actually occurring at once, whose shoulders were formed of polished marble? In Italy, when she couldn't remember the word for Campari, she'd ask for a drink that was rosso and amaro, red and bitter. The lipstick some aid has smeared on her disappearing lips has filled the cracks in her skin the same way red dust coated our arms when we hiked in the desert. The taste of it in our mouths, like the remnants of a long dry well, a bitter chalk reminding us of something we were missing. Um, and the second poem is um, from the forthcoming book, Anchor. Um, and in this, this, there's a series of poems that I wrote that are all letters to gravity. Um, and I started writing them a few years ago um, when my father who also passed away recently, um, he had Parkinson's. But before we knew that he was he was falling um, often and we didn't know why and I started sort of just contemplating the nature of gravity. Um, so I have this series of letters to gravity and this is one of them. Dear gravity, may I call you grave an old tree falls after long weakening after years of unseen hollowing and it keeps falling rotted core turning to damp dust becoming earth the body its own trench. At the doctor's office, sorry, at the doctor's office, the nurse says, I've grown shorter, only natural. I stare hard, but can't wipe the pleasant smile off her face. I am sinking, not quite like a ship or a deflating balloon, but like the house's foundation, or I am the house and the clay it is built on and eventually the unrecognizable rune. My mother's hips are out of plumb. She lists like a sailboat about to slice sideways into waves and then under. My father's head is even with my own, so he's winning the shrinking race. Imagine us becoming not just shorter, but thinner, not lying down for a last time, but disappearing altogether like a popsicle that has melted into a stain of, on someone's smile. Thank you. Oh, wow. That puts me in mind of another poet that I heard recently, but I'll have to send you her name. She wrote a book about her mother and a book about her father while they were failing. Anyway, um, thank you, Rebecca. The next poet is Carlos Damon Pantera. He has published one chapbook, Autumn Equinox. He has performed his poetry in coffee shops and larger venues throughout Albuquerque. Please welcome Carlos. Hi everyone, um, thank you Mary for inviting me and thank you to the fellow poets. Um, it's always inspirational to hear poetry um, being read and so many different voices. I wanna share a couple of poems today. 
um, I've been thinking a lot about um, Palestine and Israel and the debacle that the world is in and these entanglements of animosity. And um, the, but I, I decided that I needed a lot more time to really flesh out my feelings and to be able to work it into um, something. So what I'm gonna to offer today is a poem that's very personal and um, it's not related to, to world events at all, but very personal. And the first poem I'm gonna offer is entitled Solidarity. Moisture beneath fallen leaves, decomposing, re-entering cycles of air and fire. What is promised in the beginning, a way to touch the wide sky. I am pulling back the flame like a curtain, but I will not sacrifice the truth. My survival has depended on me not telling you the truth, not even to black men. No matter how much I loved you and risked existence to protect you, I have never been guaranteed a safe passage to myself or to my lover's mouth. In my body, I am dissolving poisons I breathe every day. You say it is political. Is it? Is a virus political? My black skin, the man I would love and marry? Not going to apologize for the battlefronts of this war. I know the peace my mind hungers for. The second poem is untitled. I need to be a foreigner in your country, an unpredictable alien you have to teach your customs, instruct in the nuances of your languages of intimacy. I am not an escapee nor a refugee from a collapsing empire. I am from a world constructed from love. Oh, thank you, Carlos. Nice to end on such a personal note. I appreciate all of you uh, giving your time and your artistry today. It's really been a wonderful thing to hear each of you. And I invite you, if you are a poet and you live near one of the uh, libraries, the Albuquerque Public Libraries that has not yet been featured in the Poets in the Libraries series to contact me so I can arrange for you to be part of the feature at your library. You can reach me at abq poet laureate program at gmail.com. That's abq poet laureate program at gmail.com. And I really appreciate your watching this feature. Thank you so much. And thank you to all of the amazing poets in Albuquerque.